for today. We'll do our introductions in just a moment. You are in rolling with the rollout, the adult learners uh, presentation for today. We are extending on some of the work that we have done in the last couple of sessions, looking at how working with adult learners is similar and different from working with your students. Um, so welcome. Our agenda for today, we're gonna introduce our team, make sure you know who it is that is supporting this session. We're gonna talk a little bit about adult learning theory, particularly the, the idea of schema and how that relates to the fact that adults come into our PD sessions with much greater experience and background knowledge than our students do. We are going to look at MLSS as a model of how new information can relate to our schema. And then we are going to give you an experiential protocol to work through some text around MLSS and really use that to process where you are, what you're doing with new information, how you can move forward. Uh, once again, my name is Eric DeSanto. I am the high school science teacher support specialist for the district. My partner in crime this morning is Abby Carlson. I'll give her a chance to introduce herself. Hi there, good morning. It's great to see some friendly faces. Um, I am here today with the rest of our team, uh, Tammy Gaudette from the math team, Molly Keys from behavior support, and Lori Arnold from ELA. I did want to bring your attention up to the recording button up at the top. Um, we will be recording just this session and your face will only be seen if you are speaking out loud to the group. So we just wanted to bring that to your attention. Thank you so much for being here. All right, once again, we're gonna be starting off with a little conversation about adult learning theory. And particularly, we're gonna be looking at the idea of schema and how that relates to memory and your prior knowledge. And we're gonna start with just an open question that I'll give you a chance to please enter your answers into the chat or hop off mute and discuss. When you are trying to absorb some new information, how does that new learning fit into your brain? Go ahead and pop your answers into the chat or hop off mute at this time. Making a visual in your head, that helps. I got a couple of visual people here. Making connections to what you already know. Those connections we're, you're gonna see, we're gonna talk about very clearly today. Taking notes and doing it, being active. We're gonna talk about how that active side is gonna be helpful. Taking notes definitely helps. One of the things that a couple of you mentioned is that idea of prior knowledge. And Lauren, just he just read my mind talking about prior knowledge again and then associating it. Very cool. Refraining from multitasking. Thank you. That, that, that's a hard one for a lot of us, I know. Um, one of the things about the prior knowledge that we want to really point out is we're not just going to use it as a planning tool but we're actually going to look at it as a metacognitive tool that allows us to bring new information in and really process where it's gonna go and how it's gonna get there and be as efficient with that as possible. And the way we do this on the next slide, we'll start looking at exactly how our brain does work with new information and with all information in general. Your brain does this by forming what's called schema. And schemas are a pattern of thought. 
that helps you organize. And the easiest way for me to visualize this is it's your filing system on your computer. And you've got that filing system pre-set up. And when you get a new file that you need to put in, you have to try to process which of these folders does it fit in? Why does it fit there? Oh, it doesn't quite fit into a folder. What do I do with it? And that processing is exactly what happens in your brain every time you're bringing in new information. Um, one of the interesting things is you are a lot more likely to notice something if it agrees with the schema you already have present. And our brains are hardwired to not notice things that disagree with the schema we have. And that's going to be one of the challenges we're going to look at with PD sessions is it's a whole lot easier to just drift right by the stuff that we disagree with and only focus on the few pieces that we agree with. Um, when new information comes in, you've got a couple choices. That information might fit. It might have to be molded a bit, but it'll fit in with the, the information that's in your schema. Or your brain can recognize that as an exception or a contradiction. And as a lot of you mentioned in your chat responses, that experiential activity can also be used to create new schema. You can create new folders in your folder system. This process, go ahead, Tammy. This process brings up some challenges and some opportunities for us as professional development leaders. Um, first, we need to recognize that the way we've been saying for the last several sessions in this series, adults come in with a lot more experience, a lot more background knowledge, which means they come in with a lot more schemas in place and they are a lot more deeply entrenched. So, it can be hard to integrate information that contradicts. If you get something in a PD session that disagrees with your schema, very often we don't have time because we've got 45 minutes, let's go, let's get out. You don't have time to really process and figure out what to do with that. At the same time, because we have so many different schema in our brains, we have a lot more entry points. We have a lot more places where we might be able to attach that new information when we begin to process. So schema allow us to recognize the challenge and take advantage of those opportunities. Um, when we look at something like the SAT process, which is going to be our model for this today, we have had so many PD sessions on how to go through the SAT process, forms that we filled out for individual students about the SAT process, years of experience with it, that our schema are so deeply entrenched, we're going to have to work very directly to change those when we get to the new system, which is called MLSS, that is being rolled out right now. There are some very specific things that we can do to mold our schema to fit the new information instead of trying to mold the new information to fit our schema. Uh, one of those, as you guys mentioned, is reflecting on prior knowledge as a metacognitive strategy. When you think about where does this information live in my brain, you start to think about what is it connected to? What do I believe or value with this information that I know? What do I believe or value with this new information? What does this do to my teaching? What is this new information going to force me to change? Um, those information, those thought patterns can directly affect your schema that are in place, allow you to create new ones. When you intentionally make connections to previous thought patterns, as a lot of you mentioned, that allows that new information to stick much more easily. And when those thought patterns are, does this agree or contradict what I've used before? 
then it really starts to surface the fact that you're using a schema and you are trying to fit this into new information. And then again, as you guys mentioned, experiential processes really allow you to, to mold those new schema because you are seeing reality in action. And that helps form a lot of these new ideas. Okay, we are now going to shift to centering this idea of schema on the MLSS rollout. And I'm going to pass it off to Abby to take you through a protocol to do just that. Abby. All right. Thank you so much, Eric. Um, we want to kind of ground you all in an opportunity to use your previous schema and learn some new things as well. So on the next slide, there's a side-by-side -side image of RTL or RTI. That's what we have years of experience in, paired with the current MLSS system. Now, if you're feeling yourself perhaps a little frustrated or confused, that's just normal part of the process. Right? It can be hard to integrate information that contradicts a schema that is already built. So if we're looking at the green area, RTI is the model we're shifting away from. It was, in a sense, focused on special education determinations. RTI was used for general education teachers who had learners who were struggling. Once students went to tier two, also known as SAT, the process was sometimes lengthy and the handoff sometimes left our students to fall between the cracks. In the MLSS model, this is a national shift of intentionality. This is happening across many states to better serve students in an environment that works for their learning needs, their behavioral needs. This is a comprehensive framework that uses increasingly intensive evidence-based academic and behavioral supports that address student needs as evidenced by data. It is important to note that with MLSS, students do not need a referral to SAT for a teacher to increase or decrease the level of intervention. That right there, that might be conflicting with what you know about the previous model. In MLSS, students may be referred to SAT at any layer if the student is being considered for retention is on an academic improvement plan, if there is a suspected disability, or if the student may meet the state definition for gifted and talented. At 11 o'clock today, there will be a specific MLSS session where we'll be talking about frequently asked questions um, so you can get more information, information specifically about creating a plan or getting any questions you need answered. But we wanted to kind of grapple with how does our old understanding impede or support moving forward and our future patterns. So on the next slide, we're going to look a little bit deeper at layer one. Layer one is the area that all students receive. There are eight indicators that should be found in all layer one instruction. In the chat, Tammy has added a link to the PED implementation guide. Now for my SAT chairs out there, you're probably well aware of this, but I un understand that some teachers, this is the first time that they're seeing this implementation guide. So what I'm going to have you look at is these eight indicators for layer one. 
And then I'm going to have you specifically focus on one of the layers. Now, perhaps you're interested in, well, what does differentiated instruction look like? That's on page 16 of the implementation guide. Okay, what about teaching teams or PLCs? How do they monitor progress? That's on page 19. If you want to know more about culturally and linguistic, linguistically responsive practices, that's on page 23. You're just going to choose one of these eight indicators to dive a little bit deeper on. Now you'll notice once you scroll to the appropriate page, there will be a description of the indicator. And then there will be a blue information box explaining what full implementation looks like. There's also some guiding questions that I find very interesting and a responsibility for each stakeholder from the district to the classroom level. So there's quite a lot of information for each of these eight indicators. What we're going to ask you to do as you're getting new information is we're going to structure this with a protocol. We're going to use the 4A protocol to help us as we're reading this new information. We're going to explore this text deeply in light of our own values and intentions. That's one way to adjust the previous schema that we have is we're allowed to assume agree, argue, aspire to the information that we're given. So in the 4A protocol, you are given a text to read silently. The text is the PED implementation guide for the one indicator you'd like to learn more about. You're gonna take notes on a Jamboard. On the Jamboard, um, you will just go ahead and Tammy, can you click over to the Jamboard? Thank you. I see Lori's already on there, Yvette's on there. So you're just going to claim one of these Jamboard note taking pages. Where it says your name, you can double click and just replace that with your name. And in the top left corner in blue, it says, which layer one indicator did you read about today? Perhaps you want to know more about culturally and linguistically relevant teaching practices. Perhaps you want to know more about positive behavior supports. You're going to put um, just a summary of what is the indicator that you're looking at. And then you're going to get an opportunity to read more about that indicator we want you to pay attention to when you are agreeing with what it's saying. Agreeing as in, yes, I do that. Oh, my school has done that for years. Yes, I believe this to be the best thing. Or assumptions. Assumptions are, are interesting. That's when you kind of feel yourself saying, oh, they don't, oh, they think this is already happening. They think we have time for this. They think when you argue, that might be you pushing back saying, whoever wrote this does not understand this can't happen or this is not best for teachers or students. And then aspire, that's our rainbow. That's a, I hear it, I want it. I think it will be better when we are there. So you are free to respond with all four A's as you're reading about this one indicator. You are free to respond to one of the A's. We want to give you an opportunity to feel yourself thinking about your thinking as you read new information. Okay, so it is 951. I will get, give us until 957. Read your indicator take notes on your Jamboard. At 9.57, I'm just going to invite you to share your thinking, share one of your four A's. And that group discussion is going to be the really rich part 
of this session today. Oh, it's now 9.52. I will give you until 9.58. We will come back together at 9.58. If you have any questions, please write them in the chat. Otherwise, we will be quiet for you until 9.58.
All right, it is now 9.58. Um, so Tammy, can you stop presenting? Because I would like to open the space for a conversation. Um, hopefully you were able to read about your indicator. And then we're hoping you had time to respond to one of the four A's. And that's what we'd like to talk about here. Which indicator did you read about? And which A did you respond to? My friend Lauren, are you going to get started for us? <laughs> sure. I didn't respond yet, but I was going to agree. I went to the differentiation page. And um, our school has been trying to implement this and um, do it well to where we're really looking at data and we're trying to um, put our groups and our students into groups. That way we can address their needs, specifically what they do need. Is it always possible? Can we always do it? Of course not. But our intention is to um, be reflective of what, what we're teaching, how we're teaching it. Um, so I was agreeing with the section. And it was really interesting to me to see the breakdown of the school leaders versus the teachers and kind of look at that. Um, that's helpful because even in the TLF position, what should be our role. So then what do we need to do? That made me think, okay, we can need to reach out because we need to provide the um, the resources for teachers to differentiate in the classroom. Are we doing that well enough? So kind of just that trickle down and kind of even going up, like what should we kind of expect of our leaders? What can we ask of them? Because they may not know. So having that as um, a guide um, and agreeing with those things that it was saying was kind of putting me at ease a little bit there just because I was able to um, attach there. <laughs> Wonderful. And I loved how you brought up differentiation, which is one indicator, but then you brought up data, which is another indicator. And then you brought up working in teams, which is another indicator. And MLSS is kind of just a well-oiled educational machine, right? Um, so thank you for kind of showing how those components combine but then also looking at the responsibilities of the different stakeholders and understanding like as a teacher, you're one part, as a TLF, you're another part. And then kind of looking up to see, oh, how might I, you know, tag in Abby to get some differentiation resources that I can share with my teachers and kind of seeing how that network really does work together. Ah, thank you so much, Lauren. I appreciate it. Who else might want to share? All right, Jessica. So I read the section on teaching teams. Um, and currently, I'm the dean of students at Osuna Elementary. So I um, work with a lot of the teachers oftentimes. And I was looking at, there was a chart on page 20 that I thought was interesting. So I was just agreeing was the one that I was going with. Um, Specifically with the rule, I was looking at classroom teachers, and it's stated in one of the bullet points, determine instructional practices and interventions, interventions that are aligned with the standards. And I think that is, you know, that's obviously best practice, and we need to do that. Um, and I think teachers are intentional, and we try to do that as teachers the best that we can. Um, one of the things that I was thinking with that is in a way of assuming that we all have those interventions and knowledge and background knowledge. So um, providing those supports and things that teachers need to um, find the interventions and differentiation that they need and those supports. And sometimes, you know, as TLFs, we offer PD sessions and offer different things to help with that. But it, then it's also teachers having the time to look at those resources and, you know, really understand what those resources are and how they can use those in their classroom with those students and pinpoint which students those resources would benefit. So my mind went all over. <laughs> exactly. And when we kind of use these structures, it's asking you to you know, aspire, argue, assume, it's asking you to do all of that. Um, a very similar conversation came up in the last session where they said, 
yeah, I'm in a pilot. I'm in the pilot. So we have exact time for doing that. But what do teachers do who aren't in the eight hour pilot do? And so then it's a conversation about equity, right? And how do we make sure all students have teachers who have time to have these great discussions about interventions and groupings and all of that? that those are great um, points to bring up. Thank you so much, Jessica. Uh, Melanie. We can't hear you, Melanie. Sorry, I'm at school, and so um, I had a class in here. But um, I would definitely want to inspire by, um, and I I think I have more questions now though than ever, what than whenever I started. And um, I'm an ELD teacher, and then I was reading through, and it was um, it, it was talking about grouping, and and it was talking about um, gosh, where's my page? <laughs> I'm so sorry. Okay, so it said um, intentional groupings and instruction decisions uh, based on the progress monitoring. Um, so I was wondering, like for my groups, if I was able to get with my administrator and be able to have them like group my groups, even though I'm teaching sixth, seventh, and eighth grade, according to ability. And and with the ELD, isn't that already a, an intervention? So is ELD an intervention? Is that what you're asking? Um, I could see that, yes. And I, I think you bring up another really important point of we have these traditional kind of models for how we service students. Um, just personally, I come from California and the way that we serviced English language learners was totally different from here um, where I had seven students that all had different ability levels, but I was supposed to teach them in the same lessons. I didn't understand that, but there weren't enough TESOL endorsed teachers to be able to um, differentiate based on needs, right? Um, so you're bringing up a really good point of who do I need to talk to and who do I need to work with to make sure that these students have the best educational environment uh, for the intervention, but also for the the lessons to move them forward in their language development right so um those are great points to bring up and i think you're spot on by saying well now i have more questions right which hello that means you're ready for new learning that means you're building a new schema right there and you're ready to fill it with more information so as a teacher i'm like ha ha i got you <laughs> but I also understand we want a little bit of control as teachers ourselves. And that's really what this protocol was meant to do, is we were trying to give you all some new information and then build a structure around, wait, what do I do with this new information? How do I feel about this new information? What new questions arise because of this information? Okay, so Tammy, if you want to bring up the next slide, we want to kind of step out of the 4A protocol and step out of the MLS, MLSS. And we want you to think about your thinking now. Because you are teacher leaders, kind of like what Lauren was saying, wait, we have to give this information, right? How did this protocol kind of expand your thinking? How did it help you establish new information? Um, Think about those four A's. I mean, how often are you asked to argue with new information or um, agree, aspire, or find assumptions in new information? So we'd like to open up for another discussion about metacognition because that is another way that our brain incorporates new information is when we're thinking about our thinking. So now we're just going to be talking about the protocol. Kind of what did you think of the 4A protocol? How did it help you change information or start thinking about future patterns or routines being impacted or how it fit or contradict? Yeah. Please share your thinking about your thinking.
I'm super patient so I can wait a while. I think it's interesting that the protocol um, kind of made it safe to argue with, with the text or kind of it gave you the space to do that because sometimes you know, you do want to look on the bright side or you do want to think or you don't want to go always be that person or you are always that, you know, like we're just kind of we it gave you that space to kind of be like, it's OK, too. Um, and that kind of even lets down a wall for me to be like, OK, what else do I need to like? Because I put that there. I argued with this one. OK, let me go to this one now. And then it just kind of opened a door for me to maybe accept what else was being provided so that I could take something from the reading. So that protocol kind of stepped me through or even just even if I didn't have an argument, I kind of was like, oh, but I could and put it there and kind of place it there and then move on for me. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much for sharing that. And um, some participants have said, well, I had to go back and read to go find an argument or um, and so if anyone felt that experience of it gave your reading a different purpose. Right. And so maybe you wanted to find an aspiration. Well, let me go read and go find the bright side of this, right? Um, so how did the protocol affect how you read? Just trying to get more conversation here. Yeah. I think it also brings in kind of your emotion and it kind of makes me process more too when I'm dealing with connecting my emotions to you know, what we're reading and with assumptions or agreeing or arguing or aspiring, it really makes me connect more to it to kind of develop that new learning concept in a different way than, you know, just if it was given to me and I just have to read it. It really made that connection for me in that sense. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that. So as teacher leaders, there are times that you have to give new information and how this protocol can be used to give new information. Um, traditionally, the SAT chair is who is in charge of giving this information, but also thinking about the PED implementation guide. How might this help different groups? And so um, some tweaks that you could make is have this printed before so that people could actually write on the text. Um, also asking them to do this beforehand where please read this and respond and come to the table ready to discuss. Um, I've also used this protocol with students. Um, it works really well for me um, in history and in science where it just gets students to think differently about different parts of the information that I'm trying to have them understand. So we hope that this is giving you a new insight for how to reach adult learners, how to respect the experience and knowledge that they bring, and how to also say, what are your values and how does this new information fit? or contradict with those values. I love that you brought that word safe, Lauren, of it, it felt safe to be the person bringing the argument or bringing the sunshine, right? Because we know that sometimes different staff members have those personalities. Well, this was asking you to have several personalities when you're responding to the text. So Eric, with that, what final words do you have for our session today? I just want to wrap up in, in quick summary and kind of return to that question that we started with. How do we fit new learning into our brains? And we really brought out this idea of schema as just a more detailed way of understanding the how we process information, how we try to get it to fit or contradict our schema. And now we're starting to realize we can actually mold our schema themselves so that the information fits more directly. And that processing is part of this, uh, of the learning process. Um, I'm glad that several of you mentioned like 
the positive aspects of this 4A protocol. I know the thing that I enjoyed the most about it when I first went through it is that it was, to me, it was more than just a safe space to agree or disagree, but it was the expectation that you would do both. And that really respected the complexity of what we're talking about. Right? Nothing in education is as easy as I agree 100%, I disagree 100%. What we do is hard. It's complicated. And this protocol really brings out a space to recognize that complexity. And I think that's beautiful. And that really helps the learning. And it helps, it helped me open up to some of the learning that I was doing as I was going through this. I want to leave you guys with the challenge then of how can you use this protocol with whatever challenging information you need to bring to your staff. Okay. Please take some time to ponder how a protocol like this can be used to help soften those schema in your staff to allow a more rich, full, complete discussion so that you guys can make even more informed and intelligent decisions about whatever the challenges are that you are facing with your students. And, you know, your school is unique. And um, hopefully this protocol will allow you to really respect that and, and approach your challenges in a new way. Uh, I wanna thank you all for being here. This has been a wonderful session. We really enjoyed the discussions and learned a lot from all of you. Uh, I always appreciate the opportunity to do that. Tammy just dropped the attendance link into the chat. Uh, please remember that now is the time to take your attendance for your official records for the day. If you have any questions, we will stick around for a few minutes uh, to respond to those questions. It is 10.15 and the MLS session, let's see, first the POC session is at 1030.